At Kelly Companies, it is no secret that they believe in the power of people. In an effort to help their Keelians get to know each other a little bit better, they decided to launch the Who Do You Know campaign. The goal was simple. Keelians were encouraged to have a conversation with someone outside of their circle. That's it. These conversations, however, have brought people together and farthered their world-class culture. Shout out to the Keelians who have made an effort to have meaningful conversations with new friends. You can learn more about those conversations, about those amazing friends, by visiting them online at KeelyCompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. Cass Sunstein, it's a name you may immediately recognize for some of us. Others, you may not, but I think it's a name you'll not forget after this episode. He's the nation's most cited legal scholar and is at the forefront of behavioral economics. For nearly two decades, he has served in the United States government in multiple capacities and worked with the United Nations, the World Health Organization. He has written hundreds of articles and dozens of books about society and culture and more. And before you yawn or you turn the channel, let me tell you this. He is not only one of the most interesting guys I've ever recorded. He's also one of the most humble and interested guys I've ever recorded. You're going to love him. When it's common, my friends, to feel jaded and unexcited in the monotony of our day-to-day lives, Cass explores how we can begin noticing the wonderful things that spark meaning, that ignite joy. Today, Cass Sunstein joins us to share his groundbreaking study of how disrupting our well-worn routines, both good and bad, can rejuvenate our days and reset our brains to allow us to live happier, healthier, more fulfilling lives going forward. Brothers and sisters, family and friends, if you or someone you love is maybe not in their dream job, maybe they're not in their happy relationship, maybe they're not in their beloved home, or maybe they're beginning to feel the humdrum of life beating them down a little bit, This conversation will awaken them and maybe you to feel happier, to feel healthier, and here's the best part, to feel more alive. In other words, they're going to re-sparkle. Remember that term. You're going to hear it again later on. They're going to re-sparkle what is possible through your journey. So without further ado, let me bring him on, author, servant, leader, scholar, and my friend, Cass Sunstein. Cass, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Well, man, it is an honor to have you on. And for a few of our listeners and viewers who may not know the name, they may slightly recognize it. And Cass, my gosh, I I know I know that name from somewhere. If they were to bump into you in a grocery store and they say, Cass, uh, tell me about you. How would you respond to that? I'd say you tell me about you. I'd rather hear about you than about myself. They drop out that they're a Sox fan, that they are from the South Side. How do you respond to them then? I'd say, which Sox? White Sox, Red Sox. (laughs) So is that true? Do you like finishing sentences with question marks? Well, talking about myself, I I feel I start to get a little embarrassed about if they ask me what about my dogs. I'm very happy to talk about my dogs. I'd like you to talk about how amazing your life was as a kid. So we'll get to the dogs in a moment, but I want to start way back in 1954, Massachusetts, man. You're a kid growing up, born into this beautiful family. Your father was a builder. Is that accurate? Yeah, he had a little construction company. At one point, it was just him, but at several points, he had two partners in Concord, Massachusetts, and Acton, Massachusetts, and around there, he had a little company, and they built houses, and he hired architects, and sold the houses, and kept us fed. When he wasn't working, because my my father was an attorney, and uh, a lot of law in our family growing up, and even still today, 
But when I talk about my dad, I, I would talk far less about his law practice and even more about the way he was as a dad. What, what was your dad like? He was happy, fun, full of energy. I never once saw him mad, not once. He loved sports. He loved soft serve ice cream. He loved fishing. To take me fishing was uh, either a joy for him or he was really good at pretending. He loved playing tennis. He loved watching tennis. He loved iced tea. His excitement about the prospect of iced tea was comparable to the excitement of many people on their wedding day. <laughs> he was a, a, an easy dad. He was never said, you're failing. If I did something that wasn't right or got bad grades or lost a sports event, never. The idea that he would be unhappy or upset is like a, a completely different universe from how his mind worked. Mm. And your mother, I know she was a school teacher. Talk about outside of school. What, what was she like as a mother? She was a substitute school teacher. My mother was very funny, really quick. Uh, she was the intellectual, the reader in the family. She was an intensely loving person who could really connect with people. She had a, a horrific temper. My dad n never got mad, not once. I don't remember that. My mother got mad a lot, but it was kind of part and parcel. Everybody's characteristics kind of fit together, if you know them well enough. It was part and parcel of her intensity of feeling. So she could get hurt and really mad, or she could, she wouldn't get mad like if I didn't get good grades or something. It wasn't like that. But she'd get mad if my dad showed more loyalty toward his sisters than toward her and her view, then it would be World War III. But she was always present and in a conversation about anything, she was fully there. And uh, I think what I'd say about her was, for me, I felt she was on my side and I want to say that in, in a very deep sense, not as just three words. There are some people in one's life who are, who are on your side. And if you get one in your growing up, you're golden. And if you get like two or three in your life, that's a blessing. And, and my mother was on my side. Hmm. You mentioned she was an intellectual and a voracious reader. That was ultimately something that you absorbed in your life. You became one as well. I, I understand, though, you loved comic books as a kid. What was it about comic books that you fell in love with? Well, they were life in brighter colors than life itself. And there was DC Comics with Superman and Batman. And they were, at that time, forgive me, DC fans, a little boring and a little up, up and away. And then, and then there was Marvel Comics with Spider-Man saying, it's your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. And uh, that was Stan Lee and Jack Kirby who were uh, subversive and rebellious and exuberant and funny. And then there was Daredevil, the man without fear, who was blind but could do anything. Mm -hmm. and the, the, the kind of political stuff about people of color and women and disabled people being able to do anything was not didactic. It was part of Marvel's sense of exuberance. So I remember a cover of Thor, where Thor was saying, vengeance is mine. And what 11-year-old kid can't think, oh my gosh, vengeance is mine? Really, that's possible? With respect to any number of real or imagined things, like uh, someone was mean to you the day before, and of course you wouldn't do vengeance, but if there's someone named Thor who was capable of it, that was great. My listeners and viewers are going to hear that background and then think your nickname applies to one area of life when it actually applies to something completely different. So your nickname in high school, Boxer. You were a tough guy, huh? You fought a lot. Is that why you got the nickname Boxer? Okay, thank you for that. I was actually, before high school, a boxer. So I was literally a boxer, and I did that as a kid. But when I was in high school, boxing wasn't a thing. 
So when I, Boxer as a nickname was the, the character, so to speak, in Orwell's Animal Farm, who when anything went wrong said, I will work harder. And this was not about putting on the gloves. It was about nose to the grindstone if anything goes wrong. So when people referred to me as boxer, it wasn't that I would fight. It was that I would work harder if things went wrong. And that was true of me in high school. If you know my grades weren't good or if my sports I wasn't doing so well, I just work harder. And uh, horrible to say, but that continues to be true to the present day. We had a podcast guest on recently who talked about the challenge of working harder and perfectionism. This in your life began as a as a young boy. What what were some of the challenges, even as a kid, of being boxer? Of just hey, if I see something out of place, I'll work harder. I'll figure out a way to make it right. Okay, so I wasn't and am not a perfectionist. So if if this is, uh, I'm sure, a deep character flaw, and readers undoubtedly notice this, that if there's something imperfect in anything I do, whether it's in the classroom or in government or in writing, I won't melt down. In government, I might melt down a little bit because that's the American people. But if it's my own writing or my own teaching, I'll, I'll work harder, but I won't think, oh my gosh. So perfectionism is foreign to me, which is probably a flaw. Working harder is some combination of short of thrilling and tiring. So I'd say right now I'm starting a new book on something that is daunting for me. I'm on the verge of working really hard on it, and I'm thrilled about the prospect, but I'm daunted thinking I won't be able to do it. Mm. But I have a little bit of, uh, this is good luck, I have a little bit of relaxation. If I can't do it, then there's a book I failed to do and nobody died. So some projects don't work out. I work really hard on them and then no one sees them and that's okay by me. The drive that you so clearly have and harness and utilize each day of your life, from where do you think that originates? Probably my mother. She was tough. She was loving, but also angry. And when I, at 11, started reading books, like real books, not just comic books, she was, it was as if the best thing she could imagine had happened, the, that her son was a reader. Mm. And and the fact that I was reading and then writing, she was completely amazed by that. I have a sister who's much older, who's fantastic, not really academically inclined. And I think my mother, who valued academics who didn't push me at all but it was more thrill at success rather than disappointment at failure she ex- said she expected me to be a c student and didn't have any thought that i'd go to a very good college when i was little and then i had momentum because she thought i was you know a reader and i could write not really write but like a 12 year old could put some paragraphs on the page And uh, I think that her joy and connection coming from something that was on a page or in a head, that that probably is what did it. Hmm. So my son, his name is Jack. He's 18 and getting ready to go off to college next year. And he and I were arguing last night at the kitchen table about something. He would just not relent on his point being right. And finally, I said, Jack, why don't you just go into law school later on? And he said, Dad, those guys have to read and write way too much. (laughs) So eventually you do go into law school. When did you realize that law school would be uh, something that you were turned on by? I think I realized I'd be turned on by it maybe the second month while there. And the fact that I went was with clarity rather than uh, tremendous excitement. So when I was a senior in college, then the question is, what do you do next? And there was being a literature PhD, and then there was going to law school. Those were the two things. And I remember getting the application materials for graduate school. Yes. And I thought maybe I go to, because I like literature a lot, but I thought that being an English professor, while I loved reading and writing literature, 
it would be too passive a life. It felt a little bit like uh, the just for me. The, it would be a little like being in a remote place doing a remote thing. It felt like for me. Whereas law school felt like you'd be more in the world and what you would end up doing, TBD, but it would be engaged. Mm. And I thought both the openness and the sense of touching the world rather than a book, that's what convinced me. And in the end, it wasn't hard. You you served after graduating Harvard Law School with as a clerk with the Massachusetts Supreme Court? That's correct. For the non-legal professors in the room, me being first in line, tell, tell us what that means. What kind of work did you do back then? Okay, so when, when you graduate from law school, one option might be to work as an assistant to a judge. And uh, if you work as an assistant to judge, you advise them on how to vote. They usually aren't all that interested in your advice, but they'll talk to you about it. And uh, you advise them on what rationale they should take, and you will write a draft of an opinion. So Supreme Court justices, and I was lucky enough to work for Supreme Court justice after the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, they write opinions and they're excerpted in the newspaper often explaining why there's a right to abortion or there isn't a right to abortion or why the president can do something or the president can't do something. It might involve climate change, might involve workplace safety, might involve war. And so typically a clerk will write a first draft of an opinion and then the judge will either throw out your draft and write his or her own, or will revise your draft and take your draft as the starting point. You have worked in some of the most prestigious law schools, state Supreme Courts, the Supreme Court, presidential administrations. You've been in the room where it happens repeatedly. At what point did you realize that this would be your career path? I mean, I, I would imagine at some point it was unfathomable that those things could happen. And then you wake up and you make your way to the White House for a, an eight o'clock meeting. At, at, so at what point do you realize, yes, I'm capable of doing this work and I, I belong in this room? Well, for the White House job, Barack Obama was a professor at the University of Chicago when I was there, and he became a friend. And when he was running for president, I worked some on his campaign and I was in occasional touch with him. And then when he was elected, I think the idea that I would go work for him, that was extremely clear that I, I knew him well. And he seemed not to think that I was incompetent. The idea that I would be in his administration, that seemed close to 100% likely. What I would do, I, I didn't know, but I knew what I wanted to do, which was the job I ended up doing. Um, I didn't think much about whether I was capable of doing it. I thought instead, I want to do it as well as I can. I didn't worry a lot about whether I could do it well. I was more focused on what are we going to do today and will it help the American people? I could tell early in my White House experience that though I'd been teaching some issues that were very close to what I was actually doing in government, that I knew much less about government than I thought I did. I worked hard on, on transition, the presidential transition. I learned a lot there. Um, but once I was in the White House apparatus, I saw there's so much I need to learn. And I behaved in a way that was very cognizant of my own ignorance. I hired someone who was very experienced in government, at least compared to me. And when they haul around these terms, like what, what about CEQ and what about DPC and what does NAM think and what about the chamber? But I knew none of this. And the acronyms were actually not only organizations, but a world of associations. And uh, I thought, uh, gulp, I need to learn. And I did my best. Man, I mean, there's so many questions I have around that. And, and I think rather than ask, asking specifics around the work, when people even hear Obama administration, 50% of my listeners turn the radio up to hear exactly what you would say next. 
and 50% of them lean forward to turn the channel to uh, to something else possibly. And I want to make sure that 100% of them still listening in realize like th th it's about spend more than that thing. So when you look back at those years spent with that administration, some people celebrated and other people said we we made some missteps. What is one thing that you helped accomplish that you you realize now looking back on it, all of us should be celebrating this? Well, you know about TSA pre and global entry? I, I was involved in the creation of those things and everybody seems to like them. Uh, I certainly do. And when you look at that time, what's something that you're disappointed by? Because we come in, I think, to all jobs in particular, a role like that with these huge expectations of what is possible. So then looking back on it, what do you regret? The U.S. government imposes billions of hours in paperwork requirements on the American people, billions of hours. My office was in charge of all of those hours, and I didn't take a hard enough run at reducing the paperwork burdens on the American people. And if that seems a little, you know, uh, what paperwork burdens, think of patients who have to fill out really long forms to get help. And sometimes they can't, they just don't know how to do it. Or think of nurses and doctors who have to spend lots and lots of time navigating some website they don't understand rather than helping patients. Or think of some developer trying to build something who has to go through a clearance process from the US government, which is like a wall between development. Or think of someone who's old or someone who's sick, who has a right to some kind of help, but they can't get it because the forms are baffling to them and maybe use terminology that they don't understand. So that 11 billion hours by one recent counted paperwork burdens, I did take a run at it and we did reduce some, but I regret that I didn't do more. And also for listeners who I hope are still listening who don't like Obama administration, let me say that the Republicans in Congress, I worked extremely well with and some of them to this day are among my closest government friends. Hmm. I believe you and the administration were part of the free and reduced lunch, being able to serve more easily kids who were at risk and at need. Is that accurate? Yeah. So one thing that Republicans and Democrats both like is the idea that if you go to school and you don't have any money, you get to have lunch for breakfast. And uh, there are a lot of poor kids who are eligible for that, but who don't have the capacity or haven't found the time or to fill out the form. So how do you do it? And so Congress enacted something called direct certification, where if you know they're poor, they're, the school can put them in. And we did a bunch of things to make direct cert certification real so that kids, if, they're, if their family doesn't have any money, they get to eat. Mm. In the midst of all this work and teaching and research, you also are one of the most prolific authors I've ever interviewed, certainly. Uh, ever sat across from. I, I've written now two books and it's taken several years off my life. You, you have written dozens of books while having a very weighty full-time job. I'm going to just walk you through a couple of the books. I realize uh, it's hard to pick your favorite child when you have dozens, but I have a few that I thought were really moving. So the first one, Nudge. You you wrote a book called Nudge. What, what's the premise of Nudge? The basic idea is that freedom is really important and to take freedom of choice away is no light thing and we as a rule shouldn't do that but that to make the right choice is sometimes difficult because people don't know what it is and a nudge might be something like a gps device a gps device is a nudge which maintains your freedom you can say i don't like the route suggested and the destination is Miami, the destination is not Manhattan. So you get to choose the destination and you get to reject the route it chooses, but it nudges you to take a particular route. If you go to the grocery store and there's something saying this product has shrimp or has peanuts in it, and some people are allergic to shrimp or some people are allergic to peanuts, this is nudging you away from something that might 
you know, make you sick. Or if there's something that has a calorie label or something that says this suntan lotion won't help with cancer, it'll help you yeah. with your tan, it's not going to re reduce the cancer risk, that th these are all nudges. So think of uh, a nutritional label is a nudge, a calorie label is a nudge, information that consumers or workers can use to their benefit, all those things are nudges. Uh, all over our country, people are automatically enrolled in savings program, but they can opt out. So that's uh, maintains freedom of choice. If they don't want to be in, they can say, no, Social Security is enough for me. I don't want anything else. That's a nudge. So companies can nudge you by saying, it's probably a good idea to get insurance for this product, but you don't have to if you don't have to. And that could be a helpful nudge or it could be a self-interested nudge. If governments are nudging you by saying, if you buy this car, it's going to be really expensive to fuel up because the fuel economy is terrible. If you buy that car, it's really good in fuel economy, but maybe you don't care about fuel economy. Maybe all you care about is the power of the car. Go for it. So that's a nudge. So the basic idea is for governments to maintain freedom of choice but make what is for most people the good choice easy. It's surprising to me in reading your work at how frequently we are making poor choices for ourselves. And I, I, I took some notes around two areas in particular. One is around optimistic bias. 90% yeah. of us think that we are a, a good driver. So if 90%, you know, the, the, the math doesn't square up there. 94% of professors say that they're better than the other professors that they work with. Almost 100% of us think that we have a good sense of humor. So that that's one. We are optimistic in the way that we view our role in our choices. So the, talk about that just for a moment. Yeah. So optimistic bias means that people tend to think on average that the things are going to be go working out for them, even in circumstances in which they're probably not going to. So 90% of drivers think they're better than the average driver. And as you say, the math doesn't work out so much on that, that people tend to think that a project will take, let's say, two weeks, uh, when it takes three weeks or a month. That's called the planning fallacy, where people are unrealistically optimistic about how long it takes to complete plans. Uh, optimistic bias is probably a good thing for our species to have, because if you're running from a tiger, it's probably not helpful to think I'm not as fast as the tiger, I'm going to get eaten. It's probably a good thing to think I can find a way that increases chances, uh, but it can create problems uh, in the in cases of safety and health. Sometimes optimistic bias can get us in big trouble by leading us not to take precautions we should. Doctors are alert to the, the existence of optimistic bias in many, and they try to nudge people to get tests or to come in every year or to go see a doctor if you're feeling some chest pains. And this is all very good in the sense that it makes life safe for people who have optimistic bias. Mm. So just rolling through a few of the other books that you've written before we get to the one that just came out, going to extremes, like minds unite and divide. And there's a quote from within that, that states, and I think we all know this, but we forget to become an extremist, hang around with people that you agree with. Just talk about that, that, that simple statement. Okay. So if you get a group of people who tend to think, let's say that climate change is a serious problem and they talk to each other for a day, the likelihood is the end of the day, they're gonna be more unified, uh, more confident and more extreme. In fact, I did this in Colorado, got people together to talk about climate change who were left of center. And by the end of their conversations, they were more left of center and they were more confident and they were more unified. Yet people who are right of center, who are discussing, let's say, immigration is a serious problem and we got to stop it. If they talk to each other, they will be more committed to that belief, more extreme and more unified as a result of talking to each other. It's called group polarization. 
And it works partly because if you have a group who tends to think climate change is a serious problem, the number of arguments that suggest climate change is a serious problem that people hear will be pretty high. The number of the arguments the other way won't be very high. And if they're listening to each other, then they're going to get really spun up. You can see this happen all over the internet where you get people all upset about something and they talk just to each other. And by the time they're done, boy, are they on fire. That's uh, a recipe for uh, social division. Well, you're bringing it up. So why not spend a little bit more time there? So if that is a recipe for that, then what is the solution to it? Because it seems like it, the thing you just defined going farther and farther left and then farther and farther right is happening in society. So what do we begin doing? to your mind, in order to draw that back together again? I think it's really great for people to talk with one another across various lines, hear people who think differently and figure out what they think and why. The chance that you'll like them is really high. The chance that you'll learn from them is 100%. You might not change your view, but the to go to an extreme or to demonize that gets less likely. Members of a democratic public will not do well if they are unable to appreciate the views of their fellow citizens, if they believe in quotes, fake news, or if they see one another as enemies or as adversaries in some kind of war. That's a quote from your book, Republic. Let's take someone who is a Democrat, let's say, who lives in New York. If you think of Republicans, not as fellow Americans who have significantly different perspectives on some of the questions that concern you, uh, if you think of them as foreigners rather than as people who are engaged in the same basic project, trying to create a well-functioning country, to treat those people as demons rather than people with perspectives that you maybe can learn from, or one or another you might be persuaded by, or you might think, I don't agree with them on any of those things, but gosh, do they love their children and their country, and it would be really fun to have lunch with them. Maybe you wouldn't focus so much on politics during that lunch, and then everything gets better. I'm affected by this partly by the fact that I taught for a long time, as you mentioned, at the University of Chicago, and there the diversity of views is phenomenal. We'll wrap up the book study right now before we get to the present one with your maybe favorite series on Star Wars. So you are a huge fan of Star Wars. The World According to Star Wars is one of your books. And one of the quotes from that book is, you are free to choose that might be the deepest lesson from Star Wars. So my, my first question is, why do you love Star Wars as much as you seem to? And then secondly, why is the deepest lesson from that long series that you are free to choose? I really like Star Wars for a long time. Who doesn't? It's exuberant, at least the first trilogy. My son, when he was seven, got entranced by Star Wars. And I was wondering why he, so many years after release, would get entranced. And then I started both enjoying it even more and admiring it more. The free to choose theme, that's what the movies are about, at least the great George Lucas movies. So if the worst person in the galaxy, that is Darth Vader, give or take an emperor, can in his dying moments, give up his life's commitment, which is to the Sith and the dark side and the emperor, because there's one thing he cares about above all else, which is his son. That is a reflection of freedom of choice, even at the darkest hour. And the fact that a father, and this is, I think, for you and me both, not surprising, would when the chips are down, sacrifice everything to save a kid. That's extremely moving, and mm -hmm. it's an exercise of freedom of choice. That was Darth Vader's choice. So in the end, the Star Wars six are the tale of Anakin Skywalker, not Luke Skywalker. And Anakin is redeemed by how he exercises his freedom of choice. And that's the line that goes through all of the Lucas movies. 
that Luke makes multiple choices, Han Solo makes multiple choices, Princess Leia makes multiple choices, and Yoda, you know, wise person with the funny word cadence, is his wisest sayings are about freedom of choice. Mm. So sometimes in the freedom of choice, we don't even recognize we have a choice to make. And I think that ties into your most recent work, which is look again, the power of noticing what was already there. Your interests are so varied and we could spend an entire different podcast talking about man, what, what peaks and stokes your interest in these types of projects. But let, let's, let's try to land at least one of them with some detail. Look again, why'd you write that one? Well, there's a, there are a lot of books out there have you noticed? And a lot of them are about like life and how to make it better or what makes it go sour. Um, there's no book about maybe the most fundamental thing about life of all, which is that human beings get used to things. So if you are, let's say, in a place with dirty air, uh, or if you go into a room where there's a lot of smoke, the first hour or maybe the first 10 minutes, you're going to think the air or the smoke. But after a while, you'll notice it a lot less and maybe not at all. In many rooms at this very moment, there's a noise. There's a background noise. It might be a hum of an air conditioner. It might be a hum of a heater. It might be a hum of something else. It might be a noise across the street. And because it's been going for a while, we habituate, we don't notice. And this is true of dogs. It's true of horses. It's true of very primitive organisms that change is what gets our attention. And things that persist, we stop noticing. And there's nothing on this. There's a lot of academic things that aren't books and that are very technical and that might be about mice and not people. But the fundamental point that human beings habituate, they stop noticing what's amazing around them. You know, looking right now across the street, I'm in Washington, D.C., those trees, I'm in, a, uh, in the city's kind of a suburb, those trees, it's beautiful and the greenery. And I'm noticing it only because of the conversation we're now having. Or there might be something not good, like there might be a boss who's really mean or a workplace thing, which is really dumb and makes people suffer. That if it's been going for a while, people habituate to it. And they think, you know, the expression is, it is what it is. That's in a way the target of the book. It's true. It is what it is. But that doesn't mean it's background noise or furniture. Mm -hmm. It might mean it's like incredible. Mm -hmm. And you ought to be grateful or it's terrible. And you ought to try to change it. Dehabituate. I don't think I need you to unpack what that means. It might mean the opposite of habituate. But one of the studies you quoted was from Sweden when they switched sides of the road to drive on. And as I was reading about that in your work, it reminded me of the last time I took my family to, I forget where we were, but I was driving on the other side of the road. And I'm a pretty good driver. I'm in the 90% who are pretty confident that I'm a good driver. But while on vacation with my kids, I was an elite driver. And the reason was, is during that entire vacation, I was completely focused on being on the proper side of the road and making sure I was making the turns just right. So I'm curious on that for a moment. Talk, talk about in Sweden, when they ran that study, what did they find and why? They actually switched in Sweden from driving on one side of the road to the other side of the road so as to come in consistent with the norms. So imagine the US, we all decided on one day, we're going to switch to driving like in the UK on the left side of the road. And you might think that would be very dangerous that we'd have six months of crash, 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 crash. Um, they did it because they wanted to be consistent with the norm. They wanted to do what other countries were doing. And so there was a time everyone's driving at the opposite side of the road. It's almost like a TV show. And I think in the TV show, what would happen is there would be a lot of crashes and it would be 
Uh, if it was a certain kind of writer, it would be funny, and another kind of writer it would be horrible. Uh, but the real world version was just as you described. The accidents went down. People started being really safer. And the reason is that as drivers, we habituate. We're, I think, most of us pretty good. But if we switch to driving on the other side of the road, everyone in Sweden became like you. That is elite drivers because they started focusing. They didn't habituate anymore. They didn't take everything for granted. They mm. know they need to drive safely. So dishabituation is the technical term. If if you have a spouse uh, you like, but you kind of take for granted, if you spend two weeks away, let's say you have to do something related to work, or maybe you're in the hospital for two weeks, and then you come back and you're with your spouse, uh, he or she will resparkle. You won't take the person for granted anymore. You've dishabituated. It's like you're on the other side of the road and you see, oh my gosh, I get to be with this person. Hmm. So there's, there's going to be a humble brag and then we'll get into the next question. But there was a time where I was at risk of taking my wife for granted, where uh, the sparkle was fading, not because of her, but because of my perspective. And I was back in 2016, I recognized this. So in 2017, I didn't travel more. What I did is I started seeking her sparkle, her beauty. And I would journal about it every night quietly without telling her. And it was to that point, the, the best year of our marriage, because the focus was on where the sparkle was and where I'd been missing it for too long. And so it was in, in your research, as you write about this, and you've studied this now, have you also noticed that? So you don't necessarily need to leave to see the sparkle, but maybe focus on it differently? Completely, definitely. So with respect to dishabituating in a way that makes you see, let's say your children or your parents or your spouse or your job or your city for the amazingness it has, it can be purely imaginative. You know, sometimes in a dream, you have a, a nightmare where someone you love dies and then you wake up or maybe you lost your job or something and you wake up and you think oh, with such relief, right. it's a, a extremely intense emotional feeling that didn't happen. And we can do that in our minds, in our waking life. Think, you know, what would it be like if I, I didn't have this in it where mm -hmm. this spouse or your home or something, then you start to think of those things as, amazing. So you needn't take a literal break. You can just, uh, uh, as you say, gratitude. One reason gratitude works, by the way, and so applause to you for, for using it, is it dishabituates. If you, you say, I'm really grateful that I get to have whatever, then you don't take it for granted anymore. You, you, you have looked again. Well, about halfway through our life, many of us experience a midlife crisis. And you write about this and look again, why is it that as we approach late 40s, 50s, 60s in some areas, many of us experience this midlife crisis? Thank you for that. that. This is one reason why writing the book was such a thrill for me, and I hope for my co-author too, that there are so many things that we see in a new light by virtue of the fact that we were exploring habituation. So if you're in, let's say, your late 40s or early 50s, there's one thing that's very different from people in their 20s, which is that life is a little gray. It might be much more uh, uh, secure, but it's a little gray. And that means it, it, for, for many people in their, let's say, young 50s, maybe they have a secure marriage. Maybe they know where they're going to live. Maybe they have kids and it's all very steady as she goes. Uh, when you're in your young 20s, you could fall in love today or tomorrow. You could learn something that will turn your life completely around. It's like there are colors everywhere. And it, that doesn't mean people are happier in their 20s necessarily than in their 50s. But it does mean that people are fully alive mm. in their in ways they might not be in their young 50s. So uh, a midlife crisis, we think of as some guy who decides to get a motorcycle and some sort of t-shirt that says something absurd, but it's more ordinary than that. It's people just thinking, you know, what's the point? I got a good life and maybe I should go to sleep now. And that's depression. 
or it's depression adjacent. And it's because of habituation. And there, there, it's just a fact, we'll, we'll have this on the spine of the book, that if you look at uh, a, a colored photograph for a long time without moving your eyes, the colors disappear. And that's what happens in midlife crisis. Everything's turned gray. So I read that. And uh, as, as most good readers, I read it. And then I went back and actually did the experiment and found it to be true. So I called bowl on it. I'm like, there's no way this rainbow drawing will fade to gray. So I went to prove myself right and found myself wrong. So yeah, you're right. It, it, it went to gray. So for those of us living in gray right now, and I don't think you need to be in your late 40s to be there. I think many, many, many of our listeners and their friends are in that gray matter in their 20s and in their 80s and everywhere in between. How do we poke through that and return to the light? How, how, do, how do we get to a point where life resparkles again? Okay, so the word resparkle I get and probably from Julia Roberts, the actress who was interviewed in the New York Times while we were doing the book, who said, what's what's a perfect day for you? The interviewer asked. She said, the perfect day I wake up, I make food for my kids. I uh, get ready to take them to school. I do that. Then I get ready to have lunch with my husband. I do that. Then by the time I'm done lunch, I'm thinking of picking up my kids from school. And then she stops herself, uh, says Julia Roberts, she says, it's boring. <laughs> But, but she says, you know, because of my job, I go away, I'm an actor. And, and when I come back, it's full of pixie dust, it resparkles. And I thought that was completely brilliant. And so take the idea of either actually or in your head, taking a break. And as you say, gratitude exercises can do that. Uh, if you go, let's say you're 75 years old and your, your life is good, but uh, you feel a little like it's too gray, uh, take two days and go to a hotel, let's say with your loved one or with a friend or with a group, take two days and spend them in another place. And then when you come back, it's just going to look different. You're going to be thrilled to be home and you're going to see things in your home that maybe you didn't see before. Or if you're, let's say, 20-something and uh, you're in a job that feels a little tedious, uh, maybe you have an opportunity to rotate to something else. Maybe some places make that possible and ask. And then if you can go do something else for, let's say, a week or three weeks, when you come back, you might see it with fresh eyes. What was gray might have colors again. I so appreciate you working a lifetime of helping us see the various colors of the world and the brilliance within them. Like it's, your work is fascinating and I'm grateful for your curiosity and for your brilliance. I think your mother saw within you what you are now reminding us is alive and well within each of us. So we have seven questions, my friend, that we guide all of our guests through as we wrap up each episode. I have a feeling you'll be capable of running this gauntlet with me, although the first one might be the hardest question for you. What's been the most impactful book you've ever read? It's called Possession by A.S. Byatt. It's a, a novel about two romances, and it's the greatest novel in the English language. We read it for maybe the sixth time, actually, in the last week, and I think the technical term is it rocked my world. Why? I, I, I'm not familiar with it. Why, why is it so moving? Well, it's it's about what really matters in life, which is uh, deep connections with others, but it's also a mystery and it's funny and it's heartbreaking and it's about friendship and love and parents and children. Mm. What's one positive characteristic or one trait that you had as a little boy reading comic books in Massachusetts? that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? I had probably a stronger sense of wonder and amazement than, than I do now, though I've retained a significant fraction of that. Hmm. So it, it begs the question, and this is 2A, I guess. To what degree did you write this most recent book for you? The idea of rekindling wonder and amazement. Zero. Yeah. It didn't have that effect, but... Okay. Uh, but I wrote it zero for, for me. I wrote it for me in the sense that I love the topic. I was very curious about it, but I didn't write it to help myself 
be amazed and resparkle. Mm. If your home caught fire and all living things are out safely and you have an opportunity of running in and grabbing one item, a physical item, what's that one thing you would return safely with? I guess my laptop into which I'm speaking right now because it has so many things I can't lose. Some of them are backed up, some of them maybe not. If you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anyone living or deceased, who would you like to be seated next to? Oh, what a great question. William Shakespeare. <laughs> What's the best advice Shakespeare or anyone else ever gave you? I got it from reading a psychologist named Amos Tversky, a book actually about him, who said he's an optimist. And the reason he's an optimist is it's rational. If Because if you're a pessimist, you suffer twice. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? It's going to be great. The final question, Cass, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like yours to read? Well, I don't, I wouldn't characterize myself as great, but the sentence I uh, give is he got lucky. Yeah, Sunstein, you got lucky, but I also think you made quite a bit of that look. I want to thank you for being part of this podcast and part of our world. A great pleasure, a fantastic discussion. I really thank you. My friends, that is Cass Sunstein. My name is John O'Leary, and today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. My friends, I told you when we began this episode that Cass Sunstein was not only a brilliant guy, not only interesting, but also interested. It's just so cool to see how alive he is in life. And I love wrapping up each of these Live Inspired episodes with a simple takeaway that you can enact today that will help you lead a more inspired life today, tomorrow, and each day going forward. Cass Sunstein encouraged us to identify the mundane and make them re-sparkle, re-sparkle. Well, how do you get something to re-sparkle in life? And part of the challenge from Cass was to step away from it for a moment. And when you return to it, you'll see it with new eyes. That thing that you once took for granted won't be taken for granted when you come back to it. So that's one approach. But I want to give you a second approach today. If you enjoy the conversation and are looking for opportunities to re-sparkle in your life, I'm going to invite you to take our in awe, in other words, re-sparkle 21-day free challenge. That's right, kids. You heard it right. Free challenge. Not trying to sell you anything. Free challenge. It's created to break through the echo chamber of negativity and growing concerns. That's why we made this program almost four years ago. This program reminds us, you and me, of the freedoms of refocusing on the things that we can control, letting go the things we can't, and then taking our next right step forward to recognizing the truth that the best is yet to come. You want to learn more about that, don't you? Well, good. Let me give you the website to jump in both feet. Come on, let's re-sparkle together. I'll be there when, when you arrive. Join me online right now at a different website. Here we go. This one is called readinawe.com. So that's where the 21 day in awe challenge will be found. It is free. It is awesome. It is empowering. You will resparkle after you do it. So check it out right now at readinawe.com. Brothers and sisters, family and friends, you know that we're always trying to provide value to pour into your life. I want to thank you for pouring a little bit of your time each week into our community, into our Live Inspired podcast family. We don't take you for granted. We're grateful for you. We're also grateful that you are telling your friends, the people you work with, worship with, work out with, and pass on the street of life, that you are part of the Live Inspired Podcast family, and so should they. So thank you for sharing the good news. I want to remind you of a truth I learned years ago. You ready for it? The foundation is firm. The headwind is real. But the truth is this. The best is yet to come. So I'll see you at readinawe.com. And until then, brothers and sisters, let's choose to live inspired. You know that Keeley Companies is all about fostering the world-class culture through their incredible cultural pillars. Well, it was time to add a seventh cultural pillar, Keeley Green. 
guided by the mission to raise the sustainability standards by which they design, build, operate, and live, Keeley Green is dedicated to using a holistic approach to leave a positive impact on our environment, create a future that is sustainable for generations to come. In the words of Rusty Keeley, we are just getting started. You can learn more about that just getting started mentality and all the work they do by visiting my friends at Keeley Companies online at keeleycompanies.com.